Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to session number 15829, Improving Hepatitis C Surveillance and Data Usage Within the Ryan White HIV AIDS Program. We have an engaging 90-minute panel planned for you today, but before we get started, my name is Sarah Woody, and I will be moderating today's session. I am a management analyst in the HIV AIDS Bureau, and I coordinate a portfolio of hepatitis C projects which aim to develop comprehensive jurisdiction-level hepatitis C screening, care, and treatment systems for HIV, hepatitis C, co-infected people of color. Improving hepatitis C surveillance can help the Ryan White HIV AIDS program jurisdictions identify, monitor, and connect co-infected people with HIV to hepatitis C care and treatment. This panel will provide federal updates on hepatitis C surveillance and practical data-to-care approaches to overcoming surveillance data gaps. Our goal is for you to take away at least one key piece of actionable information back to your programs given just how serious co-infection is.
It is now my pleasure to introduce our second speaker, Dr. Carolyn Wester, Director of the Division of Viral Hepatitis at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. The Division of Viral Hepatitis, in collaboration with U.S. and global partners, provides scientific and programmatic foundation and leadership for the prevention and control of viral hepatitis and their manifestations. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Wester. Thank you very much. I will be making this presentation today on behalf of Dr. Neil Gupta, who serves as the chief of our division's epidemiology and surveillance branch, but is currently deployed in support of the nation's COVID-19 response. I will be presenting on the topic of improving hepatitis C surveillance and data usage within the Ryan White HIV AIDS program. Next. Today's overview will include an update on hepatitis C epidemiology and recently updated hepatitis C testing recommendations, a description of the intersection of HIV and hepatitis C, and examples of existing hepatitis C continuums of care and opportunities for developing a simplified hepatitis C continuum of care among people living with HIV using laboratory results only. Next. And next. The United States is an experiencing an ongoing hepatitis C epidemic. Data from 2013 to 2016 NHANES, or National Health and Nutritional Examination Survey, estimates that 2.4 million persons in the US were living with hepatitis C at that time, representing 1% of the US adult population. Furthermore, the same data estimated that 44% of people living with hepatitis C infection were unaware of their infection. Although hepatitis C can be cured in more than 95% of individuals with an eight to 12 week treatment course of well-tolerated oral only medications, in 2018, hepatitis C remained the leading cause of death from liver disease with nearly 16,000 reported hepatitis C related deaths. Knowing one's status by getting tested is the first step toward cure. Historically, the highest prevalence of chronic hepatitis C occurred among individuals from 1945 to 1965, also known in the baby cohort. In 2012, previously risk-based hepatitis C testing recommendations were expanded to include one-time testing of all baby boomers, who at that time represented more than 70% of all people living with chronic hep C in the US. Over the past decade, the epidemiology of hepatitis C has shifted. The number of reported cases of acute hepatitis C has increased every year from 2009 through the present. The highest rates of acute um, cases are among individuals in their 20s and 30s or people of reproductive age. With a perinatal hepatitis C transmission rate of about 6%, which increases to about 11% with pregnant, um, pregnant women co-infected with HIV and hep C, increasing rates of hepatitis C among reproductive women translates into increased rates among our youngest generation. In 2015, approximately 0.4% of live births were developed from, um, were delivered by mothers with hep C infection. Next, as I mentioned, rates of acute hepatitis C are on the rise. The data here, which illustrates 2011 through 2018, indicates that the number of reported acute hepatitis C cases, as indicated by the yellow line, tripled. It's important to recognize that the number of reported cases represent only a fraction of the estimated total number of acute cases, um, the estimated cases being represented by the blue bars, which, after adjusting for under ascertainment and under reporting of cases, increased from an estimated 17,000 in 2011 to over 50,000 in 2018. Next. While rates of acute hepatitis C are rising among all age groups, the highest rates and the highest increases over the past decade have been among individuals in their 20s and 30s. These cases are correlated temporally and geographically with rising rates of opioid use disorder, and also injection drug use. With more than half of the acute hep C infections progressing to chronic infection, the rise in acute hep C cases among reproductive age adults has resulted in a shift in epidemiology of chronic hepatitis C in the US. 
Next. The data presented here was released in a hepatitis C vital signs published in April of this year, alongside the release of the updated hepatitis C testing recommendations. The y-axis indicates the number of newly reported chronic hepatitis C infections in the US in 2018 stratified by gender, yellow for females, blue for males, with the x-axis representing the person's age and years at the time of diagnosis. This slide illustrates that multiple generations are now heavily impacted by chronic hepatitis C. It also highlights that both men and women are being impacted. And if you look far to the left, that increases in chronic infections among reproductive age adults is being accompanied by an emerging increase in new infections in very young children. It's important to note that these numbers represent only newly reported chronic hep C. And give it that only 14 jurisdictions received federal funding to conduct viral hepatitis surveillance in 2018. These numbers most certainly represent only a fraction of the actual total number of new chronic cases and also only a fraction of prevalent cases. Next. Of people living with prevalent hepatitis C, NHANES data, couples, which couples survey data with laboratory results, indicated that updated estimates from 2015 through 2018, that about 40% of people living with hep C infection remained unaware of their infection. That shows an incremental improvement from the prior analysis which uh, showed 44% prevalent or um, aware, uh, um, lack of awareness. All of this data plus extensive cost effectiveness analysis prompted CDC to update its hep C testing recommendations. Next. This timeline reviews the progression of CDC's national testing recommendations, which in 1991 began with recommendation to screen blood and organ donors progressed in 1998 to include risk-based screening with the addition of HIV as an identified risk factor in 1999, and then in 2012, expanded to include one-time screening of all baby boomers. Next. New recommendations, which were updated and released on April 10th of this year, were further expanded. Next and now include at least once in a lifetime testing for all adults 18 years or older, except in settings where the prevalence of hep C infection is known to be less than 0.1%, and all pregnant women during every pregnancy with the same prevalence threshold exception. A note at the bottom of the slide indicates that testing continues to be recommended for all individuals with risk once and periodically as risk persists. And a slight note about the prevalence threshold. As I mentioned earlier, NHANES estimate that the adult, um, the prevalence of hepatitis C among the US adult population is currently at 1%, which is 10 times above the prevalence threshold. The prevalence threshold was um, implemented in the context of cost effectiveness data, recognizing that hepatitis C is a curable disease. When we get to the point where the setting prevalence is less than 0.1%, these recommendations maybe need to be updated as well. Next. These testing recommendations represent a call to action, get tested and get cured. Next slide. Okay, I'm gonna take a pause for one second because it says my computer battery is running low. So I'm just gonna check my connections and make sure everything's plugged in. Okay, well, hopefully we're okay. Next slide. As I mentioned earlier, we're observing temporal and geographic overlap of the opioid epidemic, injection drug use, increases in acute hepatitis C, and rapid dissemination of HIV and hep C among people who inject drugs. The map on the left illustrates the rate of age-adjusted fatal drug overdoses by county with the highest rates indicated by dark red shading. You can see the highest rates in Appalachia and the Southwestern United States. On the right, you see the results of CDC's county level vulnerability assessment for the rapid dissemination of HIV and hep C among people who inject drugs. 
with the counties highlighted in pink as being the 220 counties with the highest vulnerability and overlapping considerably with the highest rates of overdose deaths as illustrated on the uh, map on the left. At the more macro level, jurisdictions shaded in green on the right map indicate those jurisdictions determined to be experiencing or at risk of experiencing HIV and Hep C outbreaks. Next. Co-infection with HIV and Hep C um, is common in outbreaks among people who inject drugs. This slide indicates or illustrates an outbreak of HIV among people who inject drugs in Cabell County, West Virginia, that occurred from 2018 through 2019. You can see there was, this was that represented the largest relative increase in the US since the outbreaks in Scott County, Indiana, with more than a 20-fold increase in new HIV diagnoses pri um, above the prior annual average. Almost 90% of the individuals newly diagnosed with HIV had laboratory evidence of current or past hepatitis C infection. And this outbreak and its response ended up resulting in lasting public health impacts, including increased investments in surveillance, improved capacity to detect and respond to future clusters and outbreaks, and also service delivery improvements for people who inject drugs. Next. The liver complications of hep C are well known, progression to fibrosis, cirrhosis, end-stage liver disease, and hepatocellular carcinomas accelerated in co-infected patients. Together, these comprise the leading cause of death in this population. In addition, hepatitis C is also a systemic disease. In persons who are HIV infected and on antiretroviral therapy, hep C is associated with enhanced disease progression. Other immune effects include cryoglobulinemia, metabolic effects include insulin resistance and diabetes, cardiovascular disease and cerebrovascular disease risk is increased, rhombocytopenia occurs because of cirrhosis, proteinuria and other kidney disease are often related to cryoglobulinemia, cognitive defects and peripheral nervous system disease occur, and osteoporosis and osteonecrosis occur because of liver disease. Fortunately, hepatitis C is curable. Next, the table on this slide illustrates HIV and Hep C co-infection rates by select slides. Co-infection with HIV and Hep C varies by jurisdiction. In the middle column, you can see on average about 7% of the people with HIV were co-infected with Hep C. The column on the right begins with people ever reported with Hep C and notes that approximately 4% were co-infected with HIV. Among co-infected individuals, not shown on this slide, almost half were Black or African American. Injection drug use was more commonly reported than those with HIV mono-infection, and HIV diagnosis preceded hep C diagnosis in 83% of the cases, although this is likely reflective of the order of testing rather than the order of disease acquisition. What is obvious is surveillance is critical to, gu to guide our public health interventions. And given current limitations of surveillance data, these are likely substantial underestimates of actual co-infection rates. Next. I will now shift to the hepatitis C continuum of care. Next. Without surveillance, we miss opportunities to identify impending public health emergencies to clarify and monitor the epidemiology of health problems, to document the impact of an intervention or track its progress towards specified goals, or to utilize data to set priorities and inform public health policy and strategy. Furthermore, building a hep C continuum of care is predicated on having good data. Robust surveillance data is critical to accurately characterizing disease burden, trends, and progress along the continuum. Next. Establishing comprehensive viral hepatitis surveillance is one of the Division of Viral Hepatitis's key strategic goals for 2025, specifically to establish comprehensive national viral hepatitis surveillance for public health action. We are um, um, releasing a new funding announcement for uh, state and local health departments um, 
which is forecasted to be released September 1st, with the hopes that in early 21, we will be able to um, uh, fund uh, all states to conduct viral hepatitis surveillance. The objectives will be to strengthen the capacity of all jurisdictions to report and describe their true burden of disease, to provide a framework to develop jurisdictional hep C continuums of care, among other things, to ensure that data is collected, analyzed, and reported in a manner that informs prevention and control, and build capacity in all jurisdictions to detect and respond to viral hepatitis outbreaks. Next. When building a hepatitis C continuum of care, here the um, continuums can range from macro, like at the national or state level, to micro, which includes certain populations, like a specific jurisdiction or health system, or people with a defined comorbidity, such as people living with HIV. Two examples of continuums are illustrated here in settings pursuing micro elimination of hepatitis C. For example, on the left, an example from Cherokee Nation, and on the right, from New York City. The steps listed in both of these cascades rely on data from both laboratory testing and results as well as pharmacy data, which includes treatment in initiation and completion. Next. Because most surveillance systems don't contain pharmacy data, or if, they're due, if they do, they're not readily merged with lab result data, we were looked at developing continuums of care based on laboratory results only, of which several states and city jurisdictions are leading the way. The hepatitis C continuum of care here, which begins with individuals known to be hep C antibody positive, which indicates a history of either past or present hep, hep C infection, relies solely on receiving the following hep C lab results. That would be hep C antibody positive results, as well as hep C RNA results, both positive and negative. While the continuum illustrated in this slide does not contain pharmacy data, it does capture the most important element, which is hepatitis C viral clearance, which is the end game in hepatitis C, much as viral suppression is the end game in um, HIV care and treatment. Additionally, by following hep C RNA results temporally, it can also provide information regarding reinfection. Surveillance databases that are able to consume the laboratory results that I mentioned, specifically antibody positive and RNA positive and negative results, and evaluate them temporally or longitudinally, would be able to develop this type of cascade easily. Next slide. Furthermore, this model can be easily adapted to develop a lab result hep C cascade of care among people living with HIV. This model shown here begins with all people living with HIV, for example, from a state's HIV database or EHARS. Hep C and antibody and RNA testing um, and results then captured um, can be captured either in an HIV database such as CareWare, could be used to develop this lab result-based continuum of care, much like HIV CD4 and viral load test results are utilized to develop an HIV continuum of care. Alternatively, if these hep C testing results are not available in an HIV database, then this data could be relatively simply obtained by matching the surveillance data from EHARS with the state's viral hepatitis surveillance database, provided that that viral hepatitis surveillance database contains both positive and negative hep C RNA results. This continuum not only serves to monitor progress, but also identifies data to care opportunities. For example, for individuals failing to advance at step one, they would need to be screened for hep C. For those stopping at step two, they would need to be linked to confirmatory or RNA testing. And for those stopping at step three, they would need to be linked to curative therapy. Next. In summary, hepatitis C is a public health priority Prevalence is high for a cure, curable disease, and incidence is increasing. Universal hepatitis C screening is recommended now for all adults once, pregnant women every pregnancy, and anyone with risk 
continuing periodically as risk persists. There are substantial overlaps that exist between HIV and Hep C. There is an opportunity to eliminate hepatitis C among people who live with HIV, and public health surveillance provides an opportunity to monitor the Hep C continuum of care and achieve microelimination among people living with HIV. I'd like to acknowledge on the next slide um, some of my colleagues who have assisted in putting this slide together. Um, including Dr. Neil Gupta, who was originally scheduled to present this slide. It's not listed here. Thank you very much for your time and attention. Thank you, Dr. Wester. It's my pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Merceditas Villanueva, who is the director of the HIV AIDS program and associate professor of medicine at Yale University School of Medicine and a principal investigator for HAB's Curie Hepatitis C Among People of Color Living with HIV Demonstration Project. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Villanueva. Thank you, Sarah, for this opportunity to present some of our work that we've been doing in conjunction with you, our project officer uh, at HRSA for our uh, project, which we call Project Conquer. Project CONQUER stands for Connecticut Quantification, Evaluation and Response, HIV, Hepatitis C Elimination in Persons of Color. Next slide, please. So it has already been discussed in terms of epidemiology that nationwide estimates or modeling have predicted that among uh, persons with HIV uh, that there are approximately 1.2 million people with HIV. Uh, nationwide old estimates, uh, again, cumulatively of 3.2 million with Hep C. And the intersection between the two would estimate about 300,000 with Hep C. So about 25% estimate have HIV Hep C co-infection. Next slide. Many of you are familiar with the World Health Association Hepatitis Elimination Goals, which are quite lofty, but Overall, in terms of hepatitis C across the globe, the World Health Organization uh, would hope that by 2030, 80% of people who are documented to have uh, hepatitis, chronic hepatitis C will have been cured. Next slide. So has already been mentioned by Caroline Wester, looking at how we are doing as a nation uh, is, is uh, predicated on generating cascades of care. Many of you are familiar with the HIV cascade of care, and this is one that we've generated here in Connecticut uh, from 2018. And on the uh, x-axis are the uh, numbers of uh, diagnosed uh, persons living with HIV, and all the way to the right are people who are virally suppressed having less than 200 copies per ml of HIV, and on the y-axis are the percentage of people who have achieved that uh, milestone. So in Connecticut, uh, it was estimated that 10,344 were diagnosed with uh, uh, HIV, and on the very far hand, right hand side, 73% based on surveillance data have achieved viral suppression. Next slide. Unfortunately, there's no available comparable hepatitis C cascade of care for Connecticut. So as Caroline said, there are uh, theoretical uh, improvements that we can actually achieve this, but actually putting that into practice has been a challenge. Next slide. So in terms of estimating our co-infection rate in Connecticut, we have issues with the fact that we have an incomplete epidemiologic profile. So the actual prep, true prevalence, the extent of screening, staging, referral, linkage, treatment, and SVR are just not fully known. So an older estimate in Connecticut uh, estimated that about 70% of people who are thought to have co-infection, which ranges from 1060 to 1540, are persons of color, but this may well be an underestimate. Not surprisingly, the highest prevalence of co-infected individuals are in our largest cities of Bridgeport, Hartford, and New Haven. Next slide. So a few run-throughs of, of published uh, cascades of care. Um, so based on various data sources, this very well uh, described 
Cascade of Care, published all the way back in 2014 by Yahia et al., looked at mono-infected persons with hep C in the United States in 2014. And as you can see of that uh, uh, estimate of 3.5 million with chronic infection, the percentage who actually had achieved SVR was 9%. So, you know, not even in double digits, but again, this was a modeling uh, estimate uh, based on multiple sources of data, not just surveillance data. Next slide. So how about for people with HIV and hepatitis C? So some early data, this was by Cachet et al. in San Diego uh, in 2014, tried to estimate uh, between 2008 and 2012, again, this was more in the interferon era, how many people actually got cured? So in this particular clinic, uh, it was estimated that out of 748 people with access to care and had a hepatitis C antibody positive, 562 had chronic infection, 303 got referred for treatment, and all the way down the line, at the end of this uh, uh, upside down pyramid, only 7% had been documented to have uh, achieved cure, cure for their hepatitis C. Next slide. More recent data, and this is a, a, a study that we published for our own clinic here in New Haven, Connecticut. Out of 172 patients in, uh, in, in that particular study who had HIV hepatitis C chronic infection with hepatitis C, uh, with, a, with a, a very robust program where we had people actually looking at and being responsible for curing folks. At the end of the day, at this time period, we had a 56% SVR rate, so clearly better than the earlier studies. And uh, the people who were not cured, uh, they're up uh, in yellow, were people who were not engaged in hepatitis C care, and people at that time for which we did not have um, uh, documented SVR. So 56% um, documented SVR12 rate is pretty good, but certainly not at the WHO microelimination target of 80%. Next slide. And one further study in, in Amsterdam. Again, in Amsterdam, they have much more universal health care, so don't have quite the same challenges that we have here in the United States. But this was published in 2018, actually showed in another co-infected population a 76% SVR rate. So clearly achieving or very close to achieving those WHO microelimination targets. Next slide. So what are the challenges to creating this cascade of care for people who have co-infection? Well, has, as already been alluded, there's incomplete hep C surveillance data. Why? There's been lack of funding historically, leading to lack of dedicated staff, and a general lack of automated data entry. And so there's also been a lack of standardized matching algorithms. And while theoretically all this can happen, it's not been happening in any routine fashion. And there's also, uh, because of the lack of surveillance, an, an inaccurate determination of what's happening with the hep C care status for people who are co-infected. Next slide. So our project, Project Conquer Hep C here in Connecticut, uh, is an attempt to address the issues that are leading to the inability to generate this cascade of care. So this was funded by HRSA, SPINS project in uh, now we're in year three, about to end this in the end of September. Our project partners are, are shown here on the right, and it, it includes a partnership with the Connecticut Health Department, and they're responsible for surveillance data and for the DIS or disease intervention specialists for locating people who are out of care. We have 11 multi-site evaluation clinic partners, some of whom are Ryan White funded, and then we also had a partnership with six SSPs and uh, SUD sites because, as already been said, these uh, um, uh, clinics are very seminal to the response to people, particularly with the newly diagnosed hepatitis uh, and HIV cases in the opioid uh, crisis. And we also have a training education arm, uh, which includes the AIDS Education Training Center, and we do partner with a Project Echo site to improve, as was already mentioned, the ability to disseminate uh, best practices in our state. Next slide. So our overall project goals were to one, cure hepatitis C in persons with HIV in Connecticut, particularly persons of color who do dominate the landscape and through improvements in this cascade of care. 
We wanted to also improve partnerships with key stakeholders and certainly improve the surveillance mechanisms statewide for the co-infected population. Next slide. So the data flow model that is here is a very simplified uh, data flow model and kind of builds on what Caroline Wester had said earlier. So our two main uh, data uh, sources include eHARS, the HIV AIDS reporting system, which is quite robust with uh, multiple decades of experience. And here in Connecticut, we have what we call CTEDS, or the Connecticut Electronic Disease Surveillance System, which uh, uh, documents uh, various uh, STIs, but it also documents our hepatitis C uh, uh, cases in the state of Connecticut. So these um, two data systems can be uh, matched and can create in the purple a client list by clinic of people who have HIV hepatitis C uh, infection. And then we have our multi-site clinics here on the bottom who have client level data, which includes careware, data from their electronic records. And these two kinds of lists can be reconciled. There is some uh, uh, protected health information. We then send that data into uh, back to surveillance and then de-identify it. And we have a way of analyzing that data through a red cap, surveillance, uh, red cap analytic database that we have here at Yale University and we call that uh, uh, database the HEPCATS. Next slide. So the matching process is, is delineated here. So without getting too much into the weeds, the data sets are generated for who, uh, by, by using the EHARS and the, uh, and the CTS database, there's a matching and review process to generate a final co-infection file. This is done at the Department of Public Health. Uh, they also determine who's the latest clinician who was uh, uh, connected with that patient, and that can create a clinic line list. And so from that line list, the clinics can then start to give us much more nuanced information about the status of these patients. So, so one of the themes here is that getting the, the treatment status of these patients is not so easy. And while we can do that from surveillance, theoretically, the clinics can also weigh in in giving us much more uh, uh, detailed clinical data. Next slide. So as was already mentioned before, if you use surveillance data solely to determine hep C outcomes, there's actually uh, a lot of rules by which we can determine this. So if you look at uh, people who have hep C antibody positive, there's many different flavors of hep C PCR status. So for example, you know, if someone is hep C antibody positive, and their hep C PCR is positive on that same day, and there are two more positive PCRs, this patient looks like they're chronically infected and they have not undergone treatment. Uh, uh, now, if the hep C uh, PCR is positive on the same day as the antibody test, and then you start to see negative PCRs with different collection dates, that person was chronically infected, but then achieved SVR. So these various different rules are very important uh, for somebody to sift through if you're going to generate a surveillance-based cascade of care. Next slide. So we've actually done this, uh, and, and, it is, and it is actually quite an involved process, but we feel that we have come to a good understanding of how to implement this. And this was work that was done with our health department, but also by our talented uh, epidemiologist, Max Wegner, pictured here on the right. So he actually spent an entire year working with people at the health department to update paper, lag, paper laboratory backlogs into our CTEDS database. So this is so critical to, to the start of this process is that we have to have a, a reliable hepatitis C database. And so we did that. There's also, I should mention, an electronic interface with laboratories that is up and going, but not yet entirely complete, but that is maturing. And that is very critical to getting our database for hepatitis C up and going. So we looked at data from two timeframes, and I will report in our preliminary data uh, uh, on this project. So the two timeframes include what we call the cumulative timeframe, that is CTEDS um, uh, for all time. So CTEDS in our state started in 1994 and data that has been in that database up until January 1st of 2020 gives us a cumulative look at our cascade of care based on everyone reported with hepatitis C match for HIV in that more cumulative timeframe. 
Then we have a second time frame, which we call a report card snapshot, which is that we limited or constrained our look at CT Ed's labs for, about hepatitis C from a much more recent time frame, from 2016 to January 1st of 2020. And these were folks who were active in EHARS from 2015 to October 1st of 2019, and with that query. So why is that so important? Because because how you constrain your data is going to absolutely impact the way your cascade of care looks. So let me show you how this plays out in real time. So next slide. Okay, so Max looked at first the cumulative database. So we looked at 80,764 cases from our CT eds from the beginning of time up until January 1st of 2020. And then we looked at our EHARS data, which is constantly being updated for, for prevalent cases. And that was 10,475 as of October 1st of 2019. You do an algorithmic match of that and your co-infected numbers look like 3,689. So then you do your surveillance manipulation where you look at, as well as look at other databases. For example, you can see who has moved out of state, okay? That was 399. Well, we're not interested in those people in creating our Connecticut cascade of care because they have now moved. Obviously people have now been deceased and that's quite a lot of people because from 1994 to 2020, a lot has happened. And so a lot of people actually are now deceased and so on down the line. So there's a cleanup process that goes on here, not only with uh, uh, the surveillance database, but actually been looking at other databases, LexisNexis, vital statistics, et cetera. So this is a very data um, uh, focused project, which helps you get to an inclusion of alive and living in Connecticut of 1938 cases. Okay, so that's our starting point for this cascade of care. Next slide. So here in the pie graph, if you, uh, if you look at those original 3689 cases, okay, which we already said that a lot of those people have deceased out of state in the red, people, for example, who have antibody positive but are PCR negative, who are either spontaneously cleared or have been treated elsewhere in an older era, that leaves us with the green side. So people who have screened positive with a PCR positive, 1,371 cases, and then positive screening with an antibody positive, but we may not know their PCR status, and that's 567 cases. So focus on the green folks. Next slide. So we took those folks in the green, and we tried to look at what is their status. So that's 1,938 cases in this cumulative look. And so these include antibody positive only. We don't know what their PCR status, antibody positive, then we knew they had a positive PCR, so clearly chronically infected people. There's a sprinkling of cases that are PCR positive only, so it looks like they're chronically infected. And then we have people who are antibody positive, PCR positive, then turn PCR negative. So these people look like they're cured. And so if you then go to the next slide and you translate that into a cascade of care, where you look at these 1938 cumulative cases of which 1,371 are clearly chronically infected by our definition. And if the, of those, 501 have been cured, SVR, that would translate into 36.5% have been cured of all the chronically infected cases and 25.8% of those who screen positive. So does that look good? Does that look bad? It's not really a judgment, but 36.5% of chronically infected cumulative cases that we believe are alive in Connecticut is certainly quite far from the 80% threshold that the WHO has set. So next slide. So then we took a look at what we call much more of a report card snapshot. So people who are much more recently in the state as defined by the fact that we have a hepatitis C laboratory on them from 2016 to 2020. So by putting these constraints in, we come up with a number of 912. And so in some ways, this is a much more relevant starting point because we do know that these people are probably still living in the state. Uh, and hanging out in Connecticut. And so how do we know that? Well, when you look at people who are excluded, there are only 14 based on EHARS that have moved out of state. Why? Because their labs are still in Connecticut. So, uh, and there's much fewer who are deceased because it's a much more recent time frame. And then there are people who are antibody positive with PCR negative without documented PCR positive. So that's also a much more, more smaller, probably people 
who are spontaneously resolved. So you, we excluded a far fewer number of 247, uh, leaving us with a starting point of 665 alive, living in Connecticut, who look like we need to analyze their hepatitis C cure status. So next slide. So if we go to the same analysis here, where we look at these 912, you can see that based on surveillance data and up-to-date uh, other data, that a greater percentage in the green are people who look like they're eligible for treatment because we've now a fewer people who are deceased and this number of people who um, uh, uh, probably are spontaneously cleared so that in fact our denominator starting point looks like it's, it's much smaller because we're constrained our data to a much more recent time frame. Next slide. So if we take these uh, folks who look like they were, who are in the green, so 665 patients who look like they're eligible for treatment, then you look at antibody positive, then PCR positive, then PCR negative, 407. Uh, those are folks who look like they've been cured. So of our starting point of 665, then we need move to the next slide. So again, of these 665 who look like they're eligible for treatment, and the majority of whom we are convinced are chronically infected, 648. The SVR cure rate based on surveillance data alone is 445 or 68.6% .6 of the chronically infected and 66.9% of all the positive screenings. So that number is actually much more robust in terms of estimating who we think have actually been cured uh, in the state uh, and is much is edging up much closer to that 80% uh, microelimination target that the, that the WHO has set. Next slide. So on balance, again, these are two very different approaches to looking at cascade of care. On the one hand, uh, if you look at the cumulative approach, laboratory dates uh, from the beginning of surveillance time, it looks like our SVR rate is quite low at 36.5%. The proportion of those with antibody only results is quite high, 29%, and the amount excluded, 48%, is quite high because it's such a long time frame. People have died, people have moved, and so so that in fact, you know, it's. Uh, it's a much more modest SVR looking rate, which you know, sets a low bar for us and makes us feel like, oh, we're not doing so well. But if you look at a more snapshot report card approach, where we constrain the data to dates that are much more recent, it makes us look at the, like our SVR our rate in Connecticut is fairly high at 68.6%. .6%. The proportion of those with antibody only results is lower at 3%. It's much more up to date data and the amount excluded is much lower at 37 percent. So one can say, well, we like the snapshot look. It makes us look pretty good. But is this a much more relevant look because it's a much more um, up-to-date look and frankly much more representative, representative of the DAA time frame? Next slide. So there are limitations why we love looking at surveillance data, which is not so easy to come by, but certainly uh, is in, in a way a lot cleaner in terms of the state health department is, uh, is more involved, it's obviously involved in this. But there are limitations on surveillance data. There's data entry errors, there's reporting lags, there's assumptions made on lab results which may not be correct because the, the surveillance data can't really tell you, you know, if they actually have been treated. Next slide. So we did in parallel, uh, this is the work of my data manager, Ralph Brooks, pictured here on the left, what we call our multi-site clinics project. So it's a different approach to the data because we now talk to our 11 clinics. So these were 11 clinics that are HIV focused in Connecticut, and we talk to them. We have a data manager ensconced in every one of these clinics, and we ask them, you know, over a nine-year time frame, January 20. 2009 to September 2018, people who have HIV hepatitis C infection, what's their status? Okay, so suffice it to say that through a matching process from clinic patient rosters, matching to the Connecticut DPH, EHARS, and CTEDS using a validated algorithm, so not entirely new, but again, a validated algorithm, we came up with 1,496 unique patients in these 11 clinics who look like they have co-infection. 
So again, through a process of, of regular refinements, okay, the clinics are constantly updating their data, plus additional uh, sources like vital records, uh, DIS data, uh, EHARS data, uh, we were able to capture much more granular clinic-based ideas of what's the status of these patients. So next slide. So what Ralph did was he also created a cascade of care for these 11 clinics based on uh, their, their, frankly, their clinical input. So he looked at uh, 1,496 uh, patients. He again went through a process of as of February 2020, you know, again, looking at surveillance data, talking to clinics, again, because it was a nine-year time frame, there are people who are deceased, people who have relocated, people who have self-cleared. And of that um, uh, time frame, after going through that cleanup process, there was a bunch of people who are transferred their care out of these 11 clinics, very data intensive, but in, in many ways, clinically uh, um, accurate. There were 791 people, or 53% of that original 1496, who truly looked like they were eligible for treatment. On the right-hand slide of this uh, uh, slide, um, he generated a cascade of care. So looking at that 791, 90% of them are in active care at the clinic. This is, we, in, we excluded the incarcerated people or people who are managed elsewhere, people who got lost. Um, uh, and then that left, you know, 77% of those folks were actually had treatment initiated. And this is, you know, predominantly the DAA, the direct acting antivirals, sprinkling of people who had interferon back in the day. Uh, treatment was completed in 76%. And SVR was documented in 562 or 71% of those original treatment eligible people. And so that's also quite good. So these are 11 clinics with robust hepatitis C uh, treatment um, uh, protocols and knowledgeable providers. So again, by looking at this different approach, not entirely surveillance-based, we had an SVR rate of 71%. Uh, but the beauty of this approach is the people who didn't achieve SVR, we can go back to the clinics and say, what is up with these people? Can we get them into care? So that creates a way of communicating with the clinics. Again, 71% is clearly um, not yet at our microelimination target of 80%, but pretty darn close. Next slide. So just to conclude, um, our experience over the past two and a half years or so working in the state of Connecticut is that it is feasible to create statewide treatment cascades for co-infected individuals based on surveillance data. Our SVR rates are really dependent on what is our starting point for the denominator. Is it a cumulative look at everyone who looks like they've been co-infected versus a snapshot look of people who are, are co-infected but are residing in the state more recently? So by changing these denominators, our SVR rates improved on paper from 36.5% to about 68.6%. Our contributing factors are that in 2016, hep C case definition did change because there's more increased hep C PCR testing. There's an, um, an increased ability of an electronic lab interface. And that is so critical for other people who are watching this is if you have a lab interface that reports the negative PCRs, that is the starting point by which from a surveillance standpoint, you can determine who looks like they've been cured. There's also been obviously enhanced DAA ability uh, availability with decreased barriers to implementation. In our state, there's no fibrosis, sobriety, or provider restrictions, which is really quite key. Um, our multi-site data also shows that our SVR rates um, with clinical input corroborates this SVR trends, and it is labor intensive, but it does include our clinics and gets them engaged in this process. But they do have to be involved in cleaning up their rosters but they do it and they, they do become engaged in the process. So the Connecticut cascade is quite close to the microelimination targets based on the data that we presented. Next slide. And so this is a model that was presented by Mark Solkowski in the Digestive Disease Week in the abstract. And he looked at modeling of the overall estimated year of elimination of hepatitis C in the US by state. And I want to say that only three states in the country, Connecticut, South Carolina, and Washington, appear to be on track to achieve um, elimination of hep C. This is not the co-infected, hep C by 2030. And we're happy that Connecticut is one of these three states. 
we'd like to think our project helped contribute to this, but it's a multifactorial uh, 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 effort. Next slide. So many people have been involved in this work. The folks at the Connecticut Department of Public Health represented here, uh, our, our syringe service programs, our SUD programs, our 11 multi-site clinics listed here. Next slide. And finally, I want to acknowledge the work of, of my really dedicated team who are all pictured here for their ongoing work. Uh, it's been a lot. Uh, it's been a heavy lift, but it's paying off. And we're very happy uh, to be implementing some of these uh, projects that have been uh, discussed on a nationwide basis. Thank you very much for your time. It is now my pleasure to introduce our final speaker, Dr. Courtney Gittengill. Dr. Gittengill is the director of RAND's Boston office and a senior physician policy researcher at the RAND Corporation. She is board certified in both general pediatrics and pediatric infectious diseases and is the principal investigator on two HRSA HAB special projects of national significance demonstration projects titled Jurisdictional Approach to Curing Hepatitis C Among HIV HCV Co-Infected People of Color and curing hepatitis C among people of color living with HIV. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Gittengill. Thank you so much, Sarah, um, and thank you for having me to talk to you today about the work we've been doing. I'm gonna focus on some of the challenges of using client data in the HIV hepatitis C care cascade. We spent the last few years working closely with jurisdictions who've put tremendous effort into improving the care of their clients with HIV and hepatitis C co-infection. And we wanted to share lessons learned and next steps from the evaluation end of things as we work with data to understand the care cascade. So just to share some background with you about this work, RAND served as the evaluator for the pair of projects that um, Sarah just mentioned. Both projects had similar goals and took place over slightly different time periods and in different jurisdictions. The project work focused on disparities in the treatment of HIV and hepatitis C co-infection, and our evaluation included the development of a care cascade, meaning the steps that correspond to the path to cure, as well as assessing progress along that path of what we'll call the cascade. And one of the results of the project was the mapping of the flow of people with HIV through this cascade from um, prior to having been screened through the final goal, which was sustained cure over time. So first we reviewed the literature and gathered expert input to really understand every possible step along the care cascade for people with HIV and hepatitis C. And the dotted lines here really are just for illustrative purposes. They don't represent any actual numbers and we will get to those. But this is just to serve, uh, just serves to illustrate how the numbers might decline with each step. And you can see how complex the cascade could be given that people with HIV need to be screened first for hepatitis C, then they need to receive the results of the screening and then have infection confirmed with a PCR test they have to receive those results and be referred to therapy. Once referred to a care provider who can prescribe, they have to, of course, have the visit, potentially have a, a genotype done, and then have the appropriate DAAs prescribed or, or antivirals for hepatitis C treatment. And in some cases, or many cases, there has to be approval of the DAAs from payers, after which point the client would begin therapy, complete the therapy, be seen at 12 weeks to see if they have cleared virus, and hopefully remain uh, cured one year out. Next slide. Of course, the, this care cascade was a very detailed one, and, and not surprisingly, the data that's needed to populate each of these steps would be challenging to gather at a jurisdictional level, particularly with those that might you know, rely on patient report or client report. Uh, and so because of this, for this work, we focused on some key steps, including whether someone was screened, did they screen positive, did they have a PCR test, did they test positive, meaning did they have confirmed infection, were they described, uh, prescribed DAAs, and did they achieve cure, uh, which we defined as sustained virologic response at 12 weeks, known as SVR12, and at 52 weeks, or a year out, known as SVR52. Next slide. Um, despite site's best efforts, collecting client-level data was associated with a number of challenges. Uh, first, sites could not always capture every data point consistently, uh, because not all data for the care cascade was being captured in data systems, even when fields were updated at, to respond to the care cascade as much as possible. And relatedly, even if the data fields could be populated, sometimes it was really only possibly to do so prospectively, and so it was difficult to get pre-implementation data prior to those fields even being included. Um, and so that data would not have been defined or captured in, in any way or necessarily in the same way across sites prior to this project being implemented. We also ran into the issue of external constraints as well. Uh, so in many jurisdictions, there were restrictions at a state level on sharing surveillance data related to um, people with HIV. And so they couldn't share data with us at a client level. 
And in those cases, uh, we uh, did our best to work together to come up with a solution, which was to receive aggregate data from jurisdictions, which took a lot of work on their part, um, but was still just difficult to match up exactly to what was needed for the care cascade and with client level data that we received from other jurisdictions. Um, some jurisdictions were unable to have partner clinics share their data for various reasons or had new partner clinics join. There were changes in electronic health records during the project period that might make uh, the information sharing uh, difficult. And sometimes there could be um, barriers in terms of working with data vendors to produce the data tables that were needed. In addition, the time frame of the study was uh, relatively short in some ways only because hepatitis C is a disease that takes time to diagnose and really fully get to treatment and then to follow someone out to 12 weeks or 52 weeks obviously requires a fair amount of follow up. Um, especially taking into account that the data infrastructure was not always in place um, at the time the project started. Uh, we also ran into, of course, the impossible to predict challenge of COVID-19 and some of our jurisdictions were still in the implementation period of that during this time. Um, and while, you know, doing their absolute best to provide patient care, there was still an impact on the ability to see and screen clients, even with telehealth adaptations. Next slide. But in spite of the challenges of using aggregate data in combination with client level data, we were able to construct a care cascade, um, but we wanted to show some of the limitations we encountered just to illustrate some of the, the difficulties of using and combining data. If you look at this um, at a glance, you can see that there isn't much of a drop from HCV antibody being positive to the RNA-PCR test being positive. Um, and you might also see a pretty big gap going from RNA-PCR test positive, meaning confirmed infection, to receiving DAAs. And then the next two slides, I'm going to explore why we're seeing these patterns and what we um, have done and will do to address, to address this. Next slide. So when we first looked at screening defined as antibody, the numbers looked quite low. But this was because in many jurisdictions, uh, PCR testing was a, a fairly significant aspect of screening during the project implementation period. And this happened for a few reasons. Um, in some jurisdictions, clients got rapid antibody tests and those were typically not reported to the jurisdiction compared to, to um, antibody tests that are done in laboratories. Sometimes a client might say they had already tested positive for an HCV antibody or the healthcare provider might look at their chart and see that they had had a positive antibody test in the past or at, in another jurisdiction. And so in those cases, very reasonably, they might go to PCR. So for this reason, to really understand this first key step, we counted either an antibody test or having an RNA test as having been screened. And some ju jurisdictions could only give us this combined number. So our data is based on the presence of a test date that tells us that almost half of all people with HIV were screened. It does make it a little bit hard to go down the care cascade in the sequence you might expect, um, where you want to know how many people fail to make it to the next step of those who got antibody tested, because we can't separate out um, those who were antibody checked from all those who were screened in every jurisdiction. But if you look at our numbers, we can see that 11% of people um, had a positive uh, HCV antibody test. And we know that 10% of all people uh, with HIV in the study were co-infected based on a positive PCR test. The little missing link here is of those who were positive for HCV antibody, how many fell out because they didn't end up getting an RNA PCR test. We still get a lot of useful information uh, from this chart. But if we wanted to truly get the true care continuum here, we need to be able to separate out having received antibody and PCR. Next slide, please. Another issue is that lack of data makes a full evaluation using every jurisdiction's data through the care cascade a challenge. Um, so here you can see that it looks as though a very low number of people prescribed DAAs, um, a very low number of people were prescribed DAAs of those who screened positive. Um, but this is because not all sites could provide information about the DAAs prescribed. So if we include all the jurisdictions that could provide at least some data, um, some jurisdictions might fall out at this point, which makes it just very difficult to interpret this number because it's probably a very large underestimate because we assume that those jurisdictions almost certainly treated at least some of their clients. Similarly, we see of the small number that received DAAs that half of them achieved SBR12, but this might also be an underestimate if PCRs following treatment were not obtained or not reported back to the jurisdiction. Next slide, please. So of course, our, our first step and one that is well underway is to refine the cascade to reflect sites that could contribute to uh, most of the steps across the entire cascade, and that will give us a better picture of the true numbers across every point of the cascade. Next, we plan to compare across key client characteristics to assess how in particular people of color are differentially impacted, which was a goal of this project, 
and how other characteristics like viral suppression of HIV might impact progress along the care cascade. And then beyond this project, a really important next step will be to ultimately apply this cascade to a national population so that jurisdictions and other groups can compare their own performance on the care cascade and ultimately even develop benchmarks for performance comparison. Next slide, please. We learned a number of really valuable lessons. Um, first, it's clear that this is a very exciting and growing area uh, for research and evaluation. And in particular, the care cascade and the data needed um, to populate it is, is a growing area, um, given that uh, there still is not yet a well-established um, care cascade and, and the data to populate it. In order to populate this care cascade, it's really important to consider any restrictions on sharing protected data when it comes to planning this type of research. As you've also seen, populating the care cascade with data is complex uh, for a number of different reasons. The data sources are not as comprehensive compared to data for HIV, and HCV testing itself is also more complex. We have two different tests to confirm the diagnosis. There's a potential for spontaneous clearance even after someone tests PCR positive. There's a possibility of reinfection after cure, and yet the screening test may still stay positive, which means that all of it means that data really has to be very detailed and collected over a sufficiently long period of time. Um, proxies can be useful pending the development of more refined measures, but they don't always help to populate individual steps on the care cascade because we would end up with similar numbers uh, for two steps when a proxy is being used for another step. Finally, HIV data systems function really well to collect data and track HIV, but the data that they contain on things like HCV co-infection, mental health, and substance use services um, are inconsistently tracked, um, but these resources could be leveraged to expand to intersecting client needs. Next slide, please. Given all of the lessons learned, um, we had some thoughts about how to push forward the science around the care cascade. Of course, it would be really helpful to develop um, consensus around HCV care cascade measures for people with HIV so that we can come to a consensus on what can be reasonably collected. And this could even be revisited and refined as data collection becomes more sophisticated. Um, populating these measures, though, would require oper operationalization of standard measures to lead the development of data standards for vendors so that there's consistent data collection as well. And of course, health departments and Ryan White recipients um, need to be supported in their processes to collect the data needed for new measures, ideally by levering EHRs where possible and interchange with EHRs to facilitate data collection around the key data points that are needed, such as HCV antibody test dates and RNA-PCR lab test dates and the results and over time. And these can help uh, to populate things like SVR12, uh, which is our marker of cure. Next slide, please. It may also be helpful to build on existing relationships to address co-infection and other vulnerable populations and share lessons learned and support dissemination of findings to other populations as well. Um, national organizations working in the space could include SAMHSA, CDC, the American Association for the Study of Liver Diseases uh, that publishes the guidelines around um, HCV therapy, and of course, groups working on the opioid epidemic uh, where there are high rates of hepatitis C. And of course, uh, important local partners include substance use disorder treatment programs given the intersection with HIV and hepatitis C, as well as AETC and training organizations. Next slide. Finally, it may be helpful to develop other validated tools for data collections that could supplement the data approach to the care cascade as it's being refined and, and developed. So for example, patient surveys, such as the knowledge assessment tool that we developed for this project for other purposes, could be used in the future to help fill in gaps in the care cascade by obtaining patient reported measures. Um, other tools could be used to support the development of other quality measures related to HIV and hepatitis C co-infection as well, such as micro simulation models that could help complement the care cascade and help support decision making by modeling out potential scenarios where if one step of the care cascade is improved, what the downstream effects might be. And that could help support decision making at multiple levels in terms of where to invest to fill in the gaps in the care cascade. Next slide. And with that, I'm happy to take any questions. I'd also like to thank our project officer, um, Sarah Woody, and our colleagues at HRSA, our um, jurisdiction partners, without whose hard work to connect their clients to care, we wouldn't be able to do any of this evaluation. My colleagues, uh, Lisa Wagner and Laura Bogart, and the rest of the team at RAND. And finally, Vivian Tao, who was formerly at RAND and had headed this project for the first few years. Thank you.
Thank you, Courtney. Uh, we hope you've enjoyed today's presentation. If you would like to receive continuing education for credit for this activity, please visit ryanwhite.cds.pesgce.com. We now invite you to a brief question and answer session with today's presenters. Thank you.